Robert Jeffress, a minister at First Baptist Church of Wichita Falls, Texas, and the author of the provocatively entitled book, Grace Gone Wild, laments the sad state of grace in the church today. And I owe this introduction to um, Scott Haifman's lecture, who was my advisor at Wheaton College. In Christianity Today's interview, Robert, who, who is a pastor, assesses his own church. Quote, in the past, I've made the mistake as a pastor of trying to assure people of their salvation when they never possessed it to begin with. Here are people who profess to be Christians, but they have no interest in God's Word. They never pray. They don't want to be in the church. There's absolutely no fruit in their life. Why should we give false security to people like that? The Bible certainly gives no assurance of salvation for such people. And obviously the title, Grace Gone Wild, hints at the problem that grace then has come to mean that so long as you believe in Jesus Christ, you, you will always be saved. That faith and obedience are two distinct things. So that when you just have the grace of faith, obedience is optional. Because we don't want to be legalistic. We don't want salvation to be meritocratic. Works. Now the interviewer presses the pastor and asks the question. He brings out the shotgun, the silver bullet, when you talk about these things, then what do you say, quote, to someone who fears you are just trying to reinstitute legalism? The pastor replies, quote, it comes down to the question, what place, here's the question, here's the question, what place does obedience have in the life of a Christian? What does grace say is my responsibility in marriage in friendships, and in the church. Here's a shocking statement. I don't believe that obedience earns God's salvation for our souls, but it certainly earns God's favor in our lives. So this pastor says, obedience has nothing to do with our salvation, but it has to do with our rewards. Is that true? Our passage this morning addresses the thorny issue of obedience to the commandments of God in light of the grace of God poured out for us on the cross. Far from making obedience to God's commandments as optional for salvation, Revelation 12 makes the bold claim that obedience to God's commandments is not for rewards but rather testifies to the sufficiency of the cross and thereby protects God's people from satanic attacks, from this dragon in pursuit of the symbolic woman, which we have discovered is the church. I have entitled this morning's sermon accordingly, Keeping God's Commandments Testifies to the Sufficiency of the cross, we are faithful witnesses of Jesus and protects us, the people of God, those who keep God's commandments from Satan's harm. The importance of keeping God's commandments is highlighted firstly by the threat of Satan attacks. And make no mistake, the point of the attack is to get God's people to disobey the commandments of God. That's where the warfare happens. So God's people then are those who keep the commandments of God. So Satan's job is to attack us in order that we disobey and we sin against the Lord. So keeping the commandments protects from Satan's attacks, as we read in verse 15. And the serpent threw water from his mouth after the woman like a river in order to make her to be swept away with a flood. Remember, this serpent is the same serpent in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. The ancient serpent, the snake, the ancient serpent, as we have learned two weeks ago, perhaps, is the, 
is a serpent from Genesis chapter 2 who deceived Eve and Adam in the garden. So it's Satan. He threw water from his mouth after the woman like a river in order to make her to be swept away with a flood. What does that mean? We'll take a look at that. But the earth came to the aid of the woman. This woman, once more, is a church. It's the people of God. That is, the earth opened her mouth and swallowed the river which the dragon threw from his mouth. This water coming from the mouth, I will try to show you this morning. This water is the torrent of deception. It's figurative. The river to drown the woman, which is the church, is satanic deception pouring out against us to drown us from seeing the importance of obedience to God's commandments. And then who are these people? Of those who keep keeping the commandments of God. Notice it's in the present tense. And make no mistake, this is significant. Because God's people are presently obeying His commandments. God's people are not those, I obeyed Him in the past, therefore I have confidence in the, in the present and in the future. I don't need to obey Him now. I'll still be saved. No. Presently obeying God's commandments are those whom God will protect from the water that comes from the serpent to drown us. The imagery of Satan's attack in verse 15 with a serpent and a river to drown the woman who is the symbolic church expressly identifies the method of Satan. Namely, Satan attacks by deception and deception for the sake of destruction. Satan attacks by deception for the purpose of destruction. We come to this conclusion in light of the similar use of unique vocabulary that's nowhere else found except in Daniel chapter 9 and Ezekiel 32. So this will then give us the, the hint as to what this means, that this serpent throws water from the mouth in order to drown this woman. Follow along with me silently in Daniel chapter 9. Verse 26, and after 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off. This anointed one is the Messiah. Daniel 9 here is prophesying the future restoration of God's kingdom. And God will restore His kingdom over the earth through the Messiah. And it will come after 62 weeks. But He will do so by being cut off. As Christians, we read this as Jesus being cut off on the cross. He was separated from God's presence. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so Jesus being cut off as the Messiah establishes God's kingdom. So it is by his death on the cross that the kingdom of God has now been established in fulfillment of Daniel chapter 9. And he shall have nothing. As we remember Jesus on the cross, they tore all of his clothes. They stripped him naked. So he had nothing. And the people of the prince, this is talking about the Antichrist, the anti-anointed, who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That's talking about the temple. Its end shall come with a flood. Similar vo vocabulary here. And to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. So how will this anti-anointed, anti-Messiah, Christ means Messiah, how will this anti-Christ defeat the church? Try to defeat the church. Flood the temple. It's by this water, this mystical, mythical water that he shall drown the temple of God. Now, verse, 29, uh, verse 27 identifies what this water is. I didn't put it there because of um, space constraints, but I'll just read it for you. Just write it down. Verse 27 of Daniel 9. He, he, he identifies what this flood is. 
and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he'll put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering, and on the wing of abomination will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one's, one that is decreed is poured out on the one who makes desolate. How will he flood and destroy the temple of God? By deception. He'll make a fake covenant, and they will abide by the covenant. And when their guards are down, he will destroy utterly the temple of God. The abomination of desolation is what they call this. Now, we're not going to get into the, what it means, the abomination of desolation. But I just want you to know here, very importantly, that the means by which the Antichrist will destroy or attempt to destroy the church... Or, or the temple, is by means of deception. He will make a fake covenant, and they'll buy into the covenant, and, and once they're bought in, he will flood them, and they'll be utterly destroyed. The destruction by means of deception finds its basis not only in Daniel 9, but also in Ezekiel 32, verse 2. The Exodus account, from the perspective of Ezekiel, we, we already covered this last week, if you remember that the prevalent background to the flood and the waters and the wilderness is the Exodus account, here in Exodus chapter 32 verse 2, Son of man, take up lamentation over the Pharaoh king of Egypt and say to him, you compared yourself to a young lion of the nations, yet you are like the dragon in the seas. Notice, Pharaoh is called the dragon and in our passage, the dragon is Satan. So Pharaoh here is the symbolic Satan who set against the people of God. And you burst forth in your rivers, and you muddy the waters with your feet and foul their rivers. Here this is talking about possibly the Nile River, which was contaminated on account of Pharaoh's disobedience against God to let his people go. It's clear, I think, that the background to the mouth from the waters to flood God's people, which is the woman, is talking about satanic attacks. And such attack is by means of deception. Deception, God's people with false doctrine. The Exodus background once again establishes the imagery of God's protection of His people. Namely, God protects His people from Satan's deception and destruction, as we see in verse 16 of Revelation chapter 12. But the earth came to the aid of the woman. That is, the earth opened her mouth and swallowed the river, which the dragon drew from his mouth. What does that mean? Verse 16, this is talking about God protecting His people. So in verse 15, the serpent opened its mouth, tries to drown the woman. In verse 16, the earth comes to the rescue of the woman and opens its mouth and drowns the water so that the woman is safe. What is that? Well, that's taken from Numbers chapter 16. We see it in verse 32. And the earth opened its mouth and swallowed. The exact same vocabulary here. Swallowed them up with their households and all the people who belonged to Korah and all their gods. Here in Numbers chapter 16, Korah staged a full rebellion against Moses. And we see the Basis for his rebellion in Numbers chapter 16, verse 3. I'll just read it for you. They rose up against Moses and Aaron and said, Let it be enough for you that all the, for all the congregation are holy and the Lord is among them. Why do you set yourselves up against the congregation of the Lord? So the rebellion is jealousy, basically. He's asking, Why does Moses have absolute authority? He cried unfair. Why does Moses get to select 
who will be the elders? Why is it that Moses' brother becomes the high priest? Why is it Moses that God only speaks to him? Moses, Moses, Moses. What about us? So Korah brings up a complaint, and he then begins to incite the people to leave Moses. He's not going to bring us to the promised land. Let's go back to Egypt. And Moses says, well, I tell you what. There's one way to decide who is right and who is wrong. Moses says, whomever the earth will swallow up, those are the false teachers. And whomever the earth does not swallow, they're the true ones. Fair deal? Yeah. Now, let's dig a little deeper into their accusation. Who made Aaron high priest? God's election. Who made Moses the leader and the prophet to Israel? God's election. When they're saying, why is it only Moses? Why is it only Aaron? What are they basically saying? What gives God the right to choose? Their complaint against Moses is a complaint against God, specifically against God's election. It's not fair that God chooses one and not the other. Does it sound familiar? When you talk about election, why does God choose me and not my brother? Why does God choose some to go to heaven and others to go to hell? This complaint arises out of questioning God's right to choose his own people. And moreover, by inciting the people to go back to Egypt, Korah and his crew are actually trying to undermine and thwart God's purpose, which is to bring his people safely to the promised land, which is God's promise. So then, this whole thing is nothing more than a satanic attempt to overthrow the redemptive purposes of God. Because the Exodus, as we see, is the template through which we understand salvation for all time. The cross in the New Testament is properly understood from the perspective of the Exodus. The true slavery is not Egypt, as we have talked about, but rather from sin and death. The passing through the waters, we talked about that as the water baptism. The manna that came down, Jesus is the manna who came down from heaven. The lamb that was sacrificed in order to set the people free from Egypt, that lamb, according to 1 Corinthians, is Jesus Christ. He is our Passover lamb. So our whole redemption experience are inextricably tied to the Exodus account. And if God failed to bring his people to the promised land, then his purposes would have failed, then we would have no salvation, ultimately. Now, we may summarize the impact of Korah and the rebellion against God's people with the following comparison. So this may be a little bit over-interpreting things, but nevertheless, I, I think it's valid. If you don't think it's valid, come see me after service. Okay, here it goes. Israel, Korah, attempted to undermine God's plan of bringing Israel safely to the promised land. The church, in Revelation 12, Satan will attempt to thwart God's purposes of bringing us safely to the true promised land, the new Jerusalem, which is to heaven, and heaven will be on earth. The new heavens and the new earth will be here. God's presence will dwell among us. And in the Old Testament, Korah did this by deceiving the people to go back to the safety of Egypt. Let's not trust God's election. Let's not God's trust. uh, 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 Let us not trust God's uh, sovereignty to select his own people. But let's go back to Egypt. As we have learned in the book of Revelation, Satan will attack us by deceiving us 
through the enticement with the false security of sin, worldly pleasures, which as we have learned in the book of Revelation is the spiritual Egypt or the spiritual Babylon. In Numbers chapter 16 with Israel, the Lord preserved His plan and He protected His people. And in the church, the Lord will accomplish His purpose for us. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion for the day of Jesus Christ. Say amen. Right? He who began a good work in you he will bring it to completion for the day of Jesus Christ. And in the Old Testament, how will God... Pre- Preserve his people by opening the earth to swallow the rebellion. And here I think the church, he will do so by swallowing every satanic deception set against us. G.K. Buell in his commentary wrote this, quote, The purpose of the protection here, as in the Exodus, is to guide the church in the wilderness to her holy place, which has been prepared to us by God. So God then, it's clear, He will protect His people. Who then are God's people? If God will only protect His own people, who are God's people? Are God's people those who profess to be Christians but do not obey Jesus? The people of God whom God protects, according to verse 16, are those who obey the commandments of God. Those who obey the commandments of God, keeping the commandments, testify to the, uh, to, to the sufficiency of Christ and protects us from Satan's attacks. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Then the dragon was made angry by the woman and departed in order to make war with the rest of her seed. <clears throat> this is the second time that the dragon is made angry. We saw this in verses 1 through 7. The the dragon was exiled from heaven, and so he was angry. He came to earth. In verses 13 to 16, he was angry again because he could no longer accuse the brethren, so he's now here on earth. Here, for the third time, he's angry again because as soon as he tried to defeat the church by drowning her, God intervenes and saves the church. So he's angry again. And he departed to make war with the rest of her seed. Now I think verse 17 is similar to the rest of the passages where God protects his people from the anger of the dragon or or the serpent who is called Satan. But verse 17 I think is a little bit different because I think verse 17 is talking about the saints on earth Whereas verses 13 to 16 are talking about the saints in heaven. Remember, Satan has been accusing them day and night in in heaven, the saints in heaven. So now here, he failed to accuse them, so he's now here on earth. He's going to try to accuse the saints on earth. I think that's the difference. So he departed in order to make war with the rest of her seed, and of those keeping the commandments of God and of those holding the witnesses of Jesus. The critical identifier of God's people here cannot be missed. That is to say, those who obey the commandments of God explains what does it mean What does it mean to testify about Jesus Christ? That is, when we obey the commandments of God, we testify, we bear witness of Jesus. The the end here, uh, keeping the commandments of God, and I think the end there is an explanatory end. That is to say, those who keep the commandments of God, they testify about Jesus. They bear witness to the sufficiency of who Jesus is, as we see in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the same word, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and releases us from our sins by his blood. 
So Jesus then is a faithful witness by dying on the cross in obedience to the will of God. And by obeying God, he testifies that God's word, that God's will is perfect for him. And God vindicated his faithful witness by resurrecting him from the dead. So obedience testifies to the sufficiency of God's word, to the promises of God. As parents, we do this all the time to our kids. When Owen was first learning to swim, I told him, Owen, jump into the deep. He was scared. But is my word sufficient? Am I strong enough to save him from drowning? And when Owen jumps, which he did, eventually, Owen is telling me, Dad, your word is trustworthy. Dad, you are strong enough to save me. Dad, you will not let me drown. I testify by jumping that your word is good. And so it is with our obedience. We testify that, Lord, your commandments are good because you provide for everything that I need. So I should not covet my neighbor's BMW, my neighbor's iPad, my neighbor's TV. Because, Lord, you provide for everything I need. I will not cover my neighbor's wife. Because, Lord, you gave me the perfect wife for me or husband. I will not steal, Lord, because I trust that you provide for everything I need. Do you see how obedience testifies to the sufficiency of God's provision? as Jesus did on the cross. So we must bear in mind this crucial truth. The sufficiency of God's provision of the cross is not limited. It is not limited liability coverage, ensuring only faith, justification, redemption, salvation. So when, when people think about grace, they think about faith. And then when you think about obedience, you think about works. So grace is only limited to this side of faith, but it does not extend to the other side of obedience. They have a limited liability coverage of what grace is. It stops when it talks about obedience. Rather, God's provision on the cross is comprehensive insurance covering faith Justification, redemption, and obedience. Which then testifies to the authenticity of God's provision for us. So, the point is, you can't say, I have faith in Jesus. By the grace of God, on the one hand, and on the other hand, disobey the commandments of God. Because the proof, the proof that God's grace has been given to you is your obedience in the present. Because God's grace did not stop with faith. It extends towards obedience, obedience, perseverance, perseverance to your glorification until the return of Jesus Christ. God's grace never stops. The grace of God which enabled us to Believe in Jesus Christ, which began our road to, to salvation, is the grace of God which enables us in the present to obey the commandments of God. Jesus probes the bottom line of what is the law. Well, if you really follow the law, then sell all your possessions. Sell all your possessions that you may follow me. What does the rich young ruler say? Peace out. <laughs> Bye. He leaves. Why? 
So what is the law about? What is the law about? What is the greatest commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. This is the Shema, by the way. Hear Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one Shema, Israel, Adonai, Adonai, Echad. This is you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Now, how do we, how do we show that we love God above everything else? We obey His commandments. We don't covet because our treasure is not on earthly things. Our treasure is God. Amen? We don't lose our temper when someone wrongs us because our treasure is not ourselves and our rights, but our treasure is God and He will vindicate us. So we turn the other cheek. Amen. I know that's tough. We don't covet your neighbor's spouse or his BMW or his house because my treasure is God. I love Him. Not BMW. Not my wife. Not my house. And so Jesus gets to the bottom. Sell your possessions then if you're really following the law. And he doesn't really follow the law. Because Jesus is not his treasure. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and, and abide in I'm sorry, and, and the truth is not in him. John 14, verse 21. Wherever he has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. John 15, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. John 14, verse 15. Did, did you know that there's a lot of instructions from Jesus about keeping the commandments of God? If you love me, keep my commandments. What then is the role of obedience to salvation? Has grace gone wild? Is obedience optional for salvation so that it only is limited to the sphere of rewards, but has no effect whatsoever with our eternal destiny. I think from Revelation chapter 12, we see quite clearly that obedience to the commandments of God are not optional, but rather are the fundamental identifying marker of the people of God, of those who keep my commandments, namely, those who bear witness to Jesus. God's provision in Jesus is not limited liability coverage, but it's comprehensive coverage for us. So 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything. Everyone say everything. 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 Say it louder. Everything. everything pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who has called us by His own glory. So God provides for us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Do you believe this? That God has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. And then Peter says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and your virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours, 
Are these yours? And are increasing. They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be all the more diligent to confirm, not earn, confirm your calling and your election. When we do these things, we're not earning our salvation, we're confirming it. For if you practice these qualities, Peter says, if you're faithfully obeying God's commandments, you will never fall. For in this way, Peter says, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God provides for everything. And that provision is not limited to faith but extends towards obedience every day. So we can't say we have faith without obedience because God does not stop His grace at faith. He extends it to obedience every day. And if we do this, Jesus promises, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. God protects those who are faithfully obeying His commandments. And thereby, when we obey God's commandments, we are witnesses. We testify to the sufficiency of what Jesus did on the cross. When we give generously to the church, we're testifying that God provides everything that I need in Jesus Christ. And I will obey. When we don't covet, when we don't steal, when children, when you obey your parents, husbands, when you love your wife as Christ loved the church, wives, when you submit to your husbands as the church is submitted to Christ, you are testifying, Lord, I don't want to obey my husband, but I trust that your word is sufficient. Your word is good. You know better than me. Your word is good, Lord. Your provision is right. I will obey. I will obey. Let's bow our heads in prayer.